Welcome to Lecture 101. The historical topic is 9.3, the end of the Cold War. The theme is America in the world. There is one learning objective and that is explain the causes and effects of the end of the Cold War and its legacy. The first of the three key concepts covers Reagan's strategy in the Cold War. Reagan asserted U.S. opposition to communism through speeches, diplomatic efforts, limited military interventions, and a buildup of nuclear and conventional weapons. This and the next slide will go through all the methods listed in the key concept, starting with speeches. Reagan turned up the heat on the rhetoric he used in his speeches criticizing Soviet actions around the world. He promotes the dichotomy similar to the one seen in Kennan's long telegram from the previous period. That is, he projected a worldview that only had two sides and nothing in between. The United States was good and stood for democratic values, while the Soviet Union was bad and was attempting to increase its influence around the world. This is most prominent in his Evil Empire speech in 1983 at the height of the Soviet-Afghan War. He lays greater blame on the Soviet Union for the ongoing Cold War and arms race. Another of Reagan's most memorable speeches is one he delivered at the Berlin Wall in 1987. The wall had divided the city since its construction by the Soviets in 1961 to keep people from the Eastern Bloc fleeing to Western countries. By the time Reagan gave the speech, the Soviet Union had settled on Mikhail Gorbachev as the general secretary after unclear direction following Brezhnev's death in 1982. Gorbachev was starting to implement some liberal reforms called glasnost that were meant to ease repression and individual liberties. In Reagan's 1987 speech, he calls on the general secretary to tear down the wall to prove that he was serious about his liberalization programs. Similarly, Kennedy had also made a speech at the wall soon after its construction, in which he claimed the wall symbolized all of the communist failures and called it an offense against humanity. Reagan's rhetoric was more confrontational, especially when compared to the period of detente that preceded his presidency. There were diplomatic measures that Reagan engaged in, and the credit for the success that came from the summits should be equally shared with Mikhail Gorbachev for being open to negotiations. Reagan and Gorbachev held three different summits to reduce the amount of intermediate-range missiles that both countries had and to negotiate the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. That invasion of Afghanistan was the reason why Jimmy Carter had pulled out of the SALT II Treaty and why the United States boycotted the 1980 Moscow Olympics. Reagan's diplomatic Cold War efforts also included negotiating peace talks between the U.S. allies and long-standing enemies. The rationale is that it created a more stable global environment and reduced the risk of proxy wars that the U.S. and the Soviet Union may engage in. The example here is facilitating talks between Israel and the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Israel had recently fought a war against the PLO in 1982, which was leading guerrilla attacks from Lebanon. Reagan's administration helped negotiate a ceasefire and a withdrawal of Israel's troops from Lebanon. His efforts helped both sides come together and engage in future peace talks, though the issues between the two sides continue to the present day. Military interventions that followed a containment-style policy continued during the Reagan presidency. The island of Grenada and the Caribbean experienced a political turmoil and a military regime was briefly instituted after the assassination of the prime minister. The new military regime was more closely aligned with communism and was receiving weapons and aid from the Soviet Union. The United States invaded the island in 1983, overthrew the military dictator, and installed their own pro-U.S. leader. The invasion was successful and was completed in four days. The success emboldened Reagan to continue that type of involvement and containment policy in Nicaragua. In that instance, the U.S. sent aid to the Contras who were the forces that opposed the pro-communist Sandinista government in the Nicaraguan Civil War. The U.S. aided the counter-revolutionary group that was made up of the supporters of the previous U.S. imposed and sponsored regime that was ousted in the 1970s. The CIA helped the Contras plant mines and harbors to prevent foreign weapons from getting to the Sandinista government. Because of the uptick in violence, Congress passed a law that banned contributions to the Contras in 1984. The Reagan administration instituted a plan to get around the law by diverting proceeds from arms sales to Iran to go directly to the Contras. When it came to light, advisors in the Reagan cabinet got in trouble for it, but there was no evidence that the president knew or directed those efforts. The Reagan administration's policy of weapons buildup contrasts directly to the previous trends of detente. The U.S. developed a new B-1 bomber that traveled faster than the speed of sound, MX missiles, which are ironically called peacekeeper missiles, and they built 150 Navy ships. The last weapon that Reagan introduced was actually more theoretical than real. It was called the Strategic Defense Initiative. This was supposed to be a series of satellites and lasers that would help to dismantle any attack or a long-range missile to the United States. It would neutralize any threat that the Soviet Union could pose because these satellites were waiting in space already for any sort of attack that would happen. 
The showmanship in portraying the strategic defense initiative had a lot more of an effect than the actual weapons did, because the weapons never really came to fruition. The strategic defense initiative was really much more of a bluff, because the United States didn't really have the capability to come up with something like this. All of Reagan's spending on defense increased the size of the annual deficits. In the first five years of the Reagan administration, the national defense budget went up by nearly two times. Even though the Reagan administration cut a lot of spending on domestic programs, the increase in the defense spending made it so that the U.S. was still spending more money. Coupled with tax cuts, it created larger deficits every year, adding to the national debt. However, the buildup was central to Reagan's strategy. Reagan was betting that the Soviets would not be able to keep up with this kind of spending and that they would eventually have to back down, which was what turned out to be true. This next key concept covers the causes for the end of the Cold War. Increased U.S. military spending, Reagan's diplomatic initiatives, and political changes and economic problems in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were all important in ending the Cold War. The previous slide covered the increase in spending by the United States and the diplomatic initiatives. Reagan got along well with Mikhail Gorbachev, and that was primarily because he was unlike any of his predecessors. In 1985, he tried to implement a more open society by ending censorship and repression of individuals speaking out. This was called glasnost, and it literally translates to openness. One of the problems with glasnost is that the population in the Soviet Union had been repressed and censored for nearly their whole lives, and the first thing that they did when they were given the freedom to speak out was to voice their discontent against the government. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster also shook the confidence of the Soviet Union. There was an attempt to cover up the meltdown of the nuclear power plant in modern-day Ukraine. The residents of the nearby town were exposed to harmful radioactive contamination, and many died or developed cancer later in their lives. The Baltic states, which were the smaller Eastern European countries that were part of the Soviet Union, began calling for independence in the 1980s. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania began a series of protests called the Singing Revolution in 1987. The Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact had a history of violently putting down such movements as they did in Poland and Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. But with the new Glasnost policy, Gorbachev limited the courses of actions that the Soviet Union could carry out. By 1991, discontent within the Communist Party on the direction that Gorbachev was taking the Soviet Union manifested itself into an attempted coup of Gorbachev. The hardliners directed the KGB to capture Gorbachev and the newly elected president of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, Boris Yeltsin. They are only able to detain Gorbachev while Yeltsin confronts the military in tanks that were supposed to carry out the coup and sways them to stand down. Yeltsin addressed the crowd and vocalized the people's desires to not revert back to hardline policies. While Gorbachev survived the coup, the Soviet Union would not make it past December 1991. The Soviet Union disbanded when a majority of the Soviet Socialist Republics signed onto a treaty agreeing to disband. Each president of each Soviet Socialist Republic remained in control of the respective territories. Economic problems in the Soviet Union created a lot of discontent that led to the collapse of the USSR. The Soviet economy was weak through most of the 1980s. When Gorbachev came to power, his proposed solution was his perestroika reforms. These were free market reforms that would slowly give enterprises control of what they produced and for how much they sold it, so long as they met their government contracts first. It introduced elements of a market economy like profit incentives and competition, though the conservative wing of the Communist Party resisted it and its implementation was slow. Its full effects weren't even seen since the Soviet Union dissolved only four years after their implementation. The last key concept says the end of the Cold War led to new diplomatic relationships but also new U.S. military and peacekeeping interventions, as well as continued debates over the appropriate use of American power in the world. The new diplomatic relationships relate to the U.S. diplomacy with the former Soviet Socialist Republics and Eastern European countries that were satellite states of the Soviet Union. The new Commonwealth of Independent States, or the CIS, formed after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Former Soviet Socialist Republics joined this new organization as an economic and political alliance of former Soviet Socialist Republics. Some former Warsaw Pact nations joined NATO, which made Russia unhappy. Finally, the U.S. had to establish relations with the biggest and most powerful former Soviet Socialist Republic, Russia. Boris Yeltsin continued his presidency into 1999. His vice president, Vladimir Putin, takes over before the term was to expire in the year 2000. Putin then wins the presidency in 2000, and he has continued to be either the head of state or the head of government from the year 2000 through the present day. He's weakened the other branches of Russian government and created a party system that can easily keep him in power for the foreseeable future, since he's also done away with term limits.
The new peacekeeping interventions happened in Iraq in 1990, in Bosnia in 1992 to 1995, and in the Kosovo War in 1999. The United States led a multilateral effort in all of these countries, whether it was backed up by the UN or backed by NATO, to end attacks on neutral countries or to end attempted genocides like in the Balkan region with Bosnia and Kosovo. This debate over America's role continues even though our main foreign policy objective of engaging the Cold War was over. The United States continued to be a leader in world affairs, especially after the interventions in the 1990s. This is usually favored by the rest of the world, as long as U.S. actions were multilateral or in cooperation with larger organizations. That means that other countries or international organizations gave their approval of American intervention. The rest of the world is less happy when the U.S. acts unilaterally. Once the war on terror started in 2001 and the Iraq war in 2003, U.S. foreign policy became more unilateral. It caused the U.S. to lose popularity around the world. Finally, here's the recap. Reagan continued a U.S. foreign policy of opposing communism in the Cold War, which included continued arms buildup. This is comparable to how previous presidents led the U.S. during the Cold War with the containment policy. The Soviet Union fell after independence movements from within became successful. Finally, the end of the Cold War brought about the question about new U.S. foreign policies. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushslides.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.